Hello, and welcome to Your Art Sucks, a podcast that aims to destroy mediocrity in all forms of art. And this is episode 8, In Solitude, Henry David Thoreau and J.D. Salinger. In this episode, we will look at the idea of solitude as it relates to the artistic process. We will see how artists have been impacted by self-imposed solitude and, more importantly, how it shaped their art. Hopefully by the end of this show, we will have some idea if solitude is still relevant in today's hyper-connected lifestyle and whether or not it's a path you need to explore. Now before we dive into our featured artists, I believe we need to be clear about what I'm deeming to be solitude. There is the chance that some of you may relate solitude and loneliness as similar concepts, which, for the content of this show, are not mutual. For our purposes, solitude is the active act of separating yourself from all distraction to allow the inner voice to be front and center. The artists themselves are the one taking all the necessary steps to allow this voice to be clear and uninterrupted for a period of time that allows true inward comprehension and reflection. While solitude normally lends itself to some sort of isolation, those who are well-practiced can experience awareness in the presence of others as well as in a crowded space. Now, loneliness is the complex emotional response to being isolated, whether willfully or not. This feeling is not the focus of the episode, but it should not be dismissed by any artist. There is great truth that the experience of loneliness can be an honest avenue of exploration and discovery. But the reality is that loneliness can be one-dimensional in nature, while solitude can be a multifaceted path of awareness. And self-awareness is the key here, as it's the real purpose of solitude as it applies to artists and their creative process. Both artists highlighted today use their sought-out separation to come to terms with an inner voice that was drowned out by the everyday noises and events that ceaselessly plagued their senses. As we will hear, these artists were keenly aware of their active role in seeking solitude, and it is vital to their outcome. But did the alone time really help them create better art? To begin to answer this, let's take a look at our first artist, Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau was an American essayist, poet, and philosopher, among his many other notable skills. He's best known for his essay, Civil Disobedience, but he's also known equally as well for the novel Walden, which is the focus of this episode. To understand how Henry came to seek out solitude, let's begin with his time prior to writing Walden. In 1837, a young Thoreau, then a recent Harvard College graduate, was becoming a bit of a rebel. His inability to follow the herd had reared itself many times in his young life, but now it was clear to be a permanent part of his adult character. One could say that such rebellious behavior was in his blood, as his maternal grandfather, Asa Dunbar, in 1766, led a student-backed rebellion called the Butter Rebellion at Harvard College which, at the time, was the first recorded student protest in the American colonies. Basically, the Butter Rebellion was a student protest and walkout over the punishment Dunbar received for complaining about Harvard serving rancid butter to the residents. While it was a non-violent protest and nothing more than a minor uproar, the school did bring in the governor of Massachusetts to quell the uprising. It seems ridiculous, doesn't it? Uh, I don't know why they didn't call out the army. This is a butter revolt. So, in 1837, Henry decided to carry on this educational tradition, and he decided he wouldn't pay Harvard the $5, at the time it was $5, fee to receive his diploma. He felt the diploma carried little value at the time and decided that he was above shelling out the funds, which in today's money would be equivalent to about $127? He was clear to point out that this diploma was nothing more than a monetary grab for the college. Needless to say, he wasn't welcome there anymore, and I'm sure the faculty was happy to see him go. Outside of this display, he also stood his ground and quit his next teaching job at Concord Public School, after only a couple weeks, as he refused to submit the students to corporal punishment. No school was going to dictate to Henry. 
being somewhat disenfranchised and highly disagreeable with the way traditional schools were headed, he and his brother John started their own grammar school in Concord, Massachusetts, which was also Henry's birthplace, and they named it Concord Academy. They believed in progressive teachings that included a high reverence for nature. Now, unfortunately, the academy was closed when John succumbed to tetanus after cutting himself shaving. It was at this time that Henry's friend and mentor, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the famous poet, pushed Henry to create essays and have them published in the publication called The Dial in 1840. Henry continued to write, and his interest in nature continued to deepen to the point where he joined a movement called Transcendentalism, which, at its core, is somewhat rebellious in itself. You see, Transcendentalism emphasizes subjective intuition over objective empiricism. Those who practice it believe that individuals are capable of generating completely original insights with little attention and deference to past masters. So basically, screw everyone, screw their observations based on any kind of scientific research. I am self-aware, and I can figure my own shit out. After some time working at a graphite company, and as a tutor, Henry was in a bit of a lost state. And back in Concord, he was given some advice by a friend that would ultimately change his life. Writer Ellery Channing told him to head to the woods and, I quote, Go out upon that. Build yourself a hut, and there begin in the grand process of devouring yourself alive. I see no other alternative, no other hope for you. Now, two months later, Thoreau embarked on simple living. Uh, And in July 4th, I believe, 1845, he moved to a small house that he had built on a land owned by his other friend, Ralph Waldo Emerson, around the shores of Walden Pond. The house was in a pretty pasture and wooded lot of 14 acres that Emerson had purchased, and it was about 1.5 miles from Emerson's family home. And so began Thoreau's two-year personal experiment in these isolated surroundings, which resulted in the very legendary work Walden. This book is a collection of his observations of seasons on the pond, as well as the many species of flora and fauna that filled his senses wholly and uninterrupted. With the many disillusions of human society extricated from his life, Henry dove deep into the life that thrived around the many ponds and forests. He came to regard his environment as superior to its human equivalent and became intimately aware of each leaf and each drop of rain. As his self-imposed seclusion continued, Thoreau made several observations about the act of active isolation that, I feel, are very poignant and relative to this episode. Here are a couple. So Henry said, not till we are lost, in other words, not till we have lost the world, do we begin to find ourselves and realize where we are and the infinite extent of our relations. He goes on to say, in proportion as he, meaning people in general, simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex, and solitude will not be solitude nor poverty, poverty, nor weakness, weakness. Now, Thoreau, in his writings, also makes several points that are very in tune with what most artists may be dealing with in today's society. First, he says, when we are unhurried and wise, we perceive that only great and worthy things have any permanent and absolute existence, that petty fears and petty pleasures are but the shadow of reality. So basically what Henry's pointing out here is that it's very important to remember that the speed of our everyday lives has consequence to our existence and ultimately to our art. It is only when we slow our lives down does the universe both internally and externally speak aloud. So here's a second point. Thoreau says this. The result, he's basically talking about reading trashy books, so he says, the result of reading trashy books is dullness of sight a stagnation of the vital circulations, and a general deliquium of sloughing off all intellectual faculties. Now there he hits the nail right on the head. All one has to do is replace trashy books with, well, let me see, um, Facebook, and you'll have our society perfectly summed up. Artists who value these mindless pursuits only dull their artistic vision. Their lives become vacuous and their focus blurs. Now I would excuse 
digital artists and visual artists who play in the social digital experimental medium from this declaration. But I would strongly advocate that they heed the following statement from Thoreau on why he started this whole process. In fact, I urge all listeners to perk up and listen to this quote, as it has more truth in why solitude is vital to all artists and, really, all humans in general. Henry says this, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation, unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck all the marrow of life, to live so sturdily and so Spartan-like as to put to rout all that was not life, to cut a broad swath and shave close, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. I mean, that is just ultimately powerful. Now, after two years, he did leave this paradise and he returned to society to continue with his rebellious nature. He completely couldn't escape. But Walden was completed as a book that compresses those two years into a single calendar year and uses the passage of four seasons to symbolize human development. Best described as part memoir and part spiritual quest, Walden at first won a few admirers, but later critics have regarded it as a classic American work that explores natural simplicity, harmony, and beauty as models for just social and cultural conditions. The American poet Robert Frost wrote of Thoreau. He said, In one book, he surpasses everything we have had in America. And another American author, John Updike, said of the book, A century and a half after its publication, Walden has become such a totem of the back-to-nature, anti-business, civil disobedience mindset, and Thoreau so vivid a protester, so perfect a crank and hermit saint, that the book risks being as revered and unread as the Bible. So strong praise indeed for a work that undoubtedly could have only occurred in isolation. And to that, I don't think you can debate that point. Now, while isolation may be beneficial, we do have to be realistic in our approach. If, for instance, you decided that you were going to embark on a sabbatical, that's one thing. But for most of us, we don't have the ability to become reclusive full-time. Our creative careers do require our presence to a degree and ensure our followers or admirers or agents maintain some sense of connection. But interestingly, there have been successful artists who've maintained a full career while propagating antisocial behavior. They decided that solitude was to be maintained at all costs to allow their lives to be free from distraction. Some notable hermits are Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Mockingbird, a cartoon strip artist and Calvin Hobbes creator, Bill Waterston. I love Calvin and Hobbes. He's been really good at maintaining anonymity since he retired in 1995, and he was pretty good at it before, too. Uh, he avoided a lot of requests for interviews and photo ops. We also have Emily Dickinson, who was quite a recluse. She rarely left her house or even her bedroom. Uh, she wrote her poetry in complete seclusion and only gained fame after her death. On a more humorous note, we have Stanley Kubrick, who also sought out some alone time, but he did so to the point that he basically became relatively unknown in appearance. So, wouldn't you know it, somebody decided that they were going to be Kubrick instead. They began um, faking to be him and went around Europe and talked to celebrities and held meetings and tried to get movies made. And eventually Kubrick found out and, well, he thought the whole thing was funny and he was actually impressed that somebody would go to those lengths. And lastly, we come to the second artist featured on this episode. That would be J.D. Salinger. Salinger is the famous author who wrote the very controversial Catcher in the Rye. It's still a widely read publication, and it's, you know, one of the most studied books of the 20th century. It has a bit of a dark history, too, because it was in the hands of Mark David Chapman when the police found him after he had shot John Lennon. 
But Salinger was a true practitioner of seclusion, as he spent many years of his life feverishly protecting his privacy after publication of Catcher in the Rye. Without the occasional court appearance to stop copycat publications or sequels of his book that other artists tried to pen, he basically would have never left his home in Cornish, New Hampshire. Salinger was able to also have his photo removed from the back of his book um, on the dust cover. There was a large black and white picture of him, but it took him to the third printing to do this. So if you do see Catcher in the Rye with an original dust jacket on it that's got his black and white picture on the back, I I would say hold on to it um, because it's probably worth a little bit of money. So while J.D. did take action to be cut off from society, he did manage to have multiple marriages, which, now excluding Claire Douglas, whom he was married to for 10 years, his other relationships didn't last that long. Even as many relationships in between those larger relationships, they were fraught with tension and basically unsatisfying for both parties. It has been said that his children from these unions were somewhat agreeable with him, but his daughter Margaret did pen a book about their turbulent relationship, and that gave credibility to all the other negative accounts the press had been able to extricate from Salinger's iron fist of secrecy. But all of this is a sideshow to the reason why he's part of this episode. The reality is that Salinger was a very prolific writer in his time while he was away from public life. There are numerous accounts that he penned five novels that have yet to see the light of day. I mean, this is even years after his death in 2010. There's thousands of people patiently waiting for some of these books to be released. Now, it is interesting to note that a sort of prequel to Kretcher and the Rye was sneaked online uh, in and about 2013. Uh, now, J.D. Salinger wrote it in 1949 for Harper's Bazaar magazine, but he pulled it before its publication and he barred it from being published until 50 years after his death. Now, technically, that would be 2060. But the story is titled uh, The Ocean Full of Bowling Balls, and it's probably still leaked online somewhere if you're interested in reading about it. In regards to Catcher in the Rye, what we do know is that the main character, Holden Coalfield, he desperately wanted to leave New York and head out west to live a life of seclusion. Salinger has said that the novel is more autobiographical in nature, as he shared the same life of Holden. His life was the life of seclusion. Salinger managed to evade interviews and mainstream press for 44 years. I mean, that's quite an achievement, I'd say, and one which I doubt would be possible today unless extreme measures were taken. Now, on a side note, I did want to point out that both Thoreau and Salinger shared some pretty interesting points. They both had issues with the educational system in that they both left schools due to disillusionment. They also both removed themselves from society to pursue their work in a more natural setting. And both were influenced by religions or belief structures that focused on enlightenment through meditative practice. Salinger, he was kind of a practicing Buddhist, and some aspects to Buddhism are focusing on oneness with nature as a guiding principle. And as we know, Thoreau was a believer in transcendentalism, which again is a belief in personal growth through direct observation of nature. Now, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that many artists struggle with formal education and religion as it relates to their artistic pursuits and inner voice. For these artists, we can see that there was far too much noise in public life preventing them from being able to reconcile their passions and processes. The great inventor Tesla put it best when he said, The mind is sharper and keener in seclusion and uninterrupted solitude. No big laboratory is needed in which to think. Originality thrives in seclusion, free from outside influence, beating upon us to cripple the creative mind. Be alone, he says. That is the secret of invention. Be alone. That is when ideas are born. That is why many of the earthly miracles have had their genesis in humble surroundings. And I I basically couldn't agree more. Far too many of us have, unwittingly, become masters of multitasking to the point that our lives are an endless stream of activity that does little to allow our true artistry to be heard. We are overwhelmed by data on a second-by-second basis. Our habits have allowed the outside world to take up so much space that far too little is left for our self-reflection. 
We are, sadly, simple information digestion machines, and our appetites are voracious, and they are left unsatisfied most of the time. How many artists are able to hear their ideas or concept amongst all these cloud-based ones and zeros is beyond my comprehension. A sad consequence of the loss of your voice is this unknowing loss of your own person. Now to push this point, here's a great quote from uh, Frederick Nietzsche. He says, This is why I go into solitude, so as not to drink out of everybody's cistern. When I am among the many, I live as the many do. I do not think as I really think. After a time, it always seems as though they want to banish me from myself and rob me of my soul, and I grow angry with everybody and fear everybody. Now, it's interesting because this was written decades ago, but the funny part is Nietzsche really nailed everything on the head that's going on today. You know, there's, there's this growing anger with everybody. There's this growing fear of everybody in, uh, in today's society. It's just interesting to note that, I mean, while it is about solitude itself, it's about, you know, life in general. And it's a great quote there. Maybe some of us choose to avoid solitude as a concept because it's too foreign or too full of fear of what might be heard or experienced. Some of us may actively avoid this path and may be struggling consciously or unconsciously with their artistry as a result. Now, psychoanalyst and writer Adam Phillips I've mentioned him in other episodes as well. Uh, he wrote an essay called On Risk and Solitude. This is part of an amazing collection, which I, I fully recommend. The collection is called, it's kind of a funny title, it's called On Kissing, Tickling, and Being Bored, Psychoanalytic Essays on the Unexamined Life. So Adam Phillips says the following uh, about our aversion to solitude as being a byproduct of our, of our youth. He says this, an affinity for solitude is comparable only to one's affinity for certain other people. And yet one's first experience of solitude, like one's first experience of the other, is fraught with danger. The absence of the visible and the absence of the object, and the risk, as in dreams, that innermost thoughts will come to light. For this reason, perhaps, it is the phobia relating to solitude that, for some people, persists throughout life. He's saying we may harbor a fear of being alone that may have stemmed from early relationships or early avoidance issues. If we honestly look at ourselves, um, we have to see if such an aversion is present within. We have to see if we've been living a limited existence of avoidance. This may be a point, or after this episode, you may want to sit down and ask yourself, is solitude a path you are willing to take? If you have no objections, then great. But if you find yourself not willing to disconnect, there may be some space within you that needs to be further examined. I mean, it may be tough to go through this activity, as you know, you may find obstacles that are quite great, but to fail to even try is, is to me, it's, it's a way to stunt your growth as an artist. Now, Phillips also makes mention of this failure in that he states that artists who deny exploration of creative destruction through intense self-reflection are basically never free. He says this, he says, The risk in destructiveness is that it may not be withstood. The risk of establishing one's solitude is the risk of one's potential freedom. If you're not willing to kind of allow yourself to expose all those feelings and ideas that come from within, if you don't want to give yourself that time, you're not going to be truly free. You have to risk that destructiveness of whatever egoic beliefs you have about yourself. You have to risk that in order to understand potential freedoms that, that may come from stripping that wall down. So regardless of our feelings of solitude, there's far more to gain from its practice than to lose. There are volumes of articles by respected psychologists who see active and productive isolation as a way to become more confident, uh, more relaxed, and more importantly, more resolved in their own oneness. Solitude is a proven method to gain a better understanding of who you are as an artist. It is also one of the few ways to allow your brain to process new ideas and, and vet concepts essential for renewal and regrowth. To not practice solitude and to stay in that 
constant connection of activity is to be nothing more than an unidentifiable vessel that projects the thoughts and ideas of others. It's basically the decay of you as an artist. Now, I know this is somewhat of a weighty topic, and it it will inevitably be one that you, the artist, must kind of flesh out for yourself. Do you take the steps in solitude? Do you look at the active state of reflection and risk destruction of your current's egoic self? Or do you allow the voices of others to drown the voice you carry within? Do you fall victim to a modern connectivity that produces art of an unoriginal and clouded origin? So let me leave you with a quote from our, again, our friend Andrew Phillips. Uh, he, he also said this, and this is a good one too. He says, Fertile solitude is absolutely essential, not only for our creativity, but for the most basic fabric of our happiness. Without time and space unburdened from external input and social strain, we'd be unable to fully inhabit our interior life which is the raw material of all art. That right there is amazing to say. And it's what we, we've said before. If you do not unplug, if you do not allow yourself that time from all the webs that you are tangled in of connection, you'll never fully inhabit your interior life, that inner voice that you have as an artist, the very same voice that propels you to be an artist, will never be fully realized that to realize its full potential, that raw material that you have inside you, it has to come out through fertile solitude. I love that word, fertile solitude. And he says it's absolutely essential for our creativity. Hopefully you found this episode entertaining and interesting and, and hopefully useful. I know it was a bit heavy, um, but there, there are times when I thought about solitude, I, it's kind of an interesting subject. Um, you know, for most of us, it's an extremely hard thing to, to find in our lives. So I wanted to put it out there and, and kind of look at artists that have used solitude uh, effectively in their lives and, and produced amazing work that has, uh, you know, been passed through decades and still holds relevance. Also wanted to bring quotes to you from people who have lived, you know, many decades ago who experienced the same type of issue. So I hope that you can take this uh, and think back upon it and, and, and really try to push yourself to pursue that fertile solitude to, to get that full effect of your inner voice and, and to allow it to build. And, um, you know, secondly, I just want to add this. I find people that get stuck you know, in their artistic medium, they, they can't push themselves forward. I believe to some degree, this is because their inner voice has died, or their inner voice has been drowned out by, you know, life that, that surrounds it. So I also feel that that solitude is important for you to, to reinvent yourself, to, to re-energize yourself, to, to allow you to move forward. So, okay, that, that's enough for that. But I just, I believe this is a very strong episode in the sense that I think it's helpful to, to a lot of people. Um, and now, Stop listening to me and go enjoy some alone time. 